Okay, well, thank you everyone for, uh, for coming along tonight for the uh, first of a series of events organised by the Department of European and International Studies here at King's College London to celebrate our 30th birthday. Uh, we started offering the first degrees in European Studies in 1992. So King's was one of the first and is now one of the oldest institutions in the UK to have a dedicated European Studies programme. Uh, by no small coincidence, we happen to be joined by the first head of department, uh, Professor Christoph Meyer. Um, and since its uh, founding, EIS has been growing into a larger and larger department offering uh, a greater option of courses and research on all aspects of Europe and the international. So we've got a series of events to celebrate our 30th birthday. You can follow us on Twitter at King's EIS and also using the hashtag uh, EIS at 30. So tonight we're going to be uh, holding a little round table to discuss this theme of war, crisis and a change in Europe. Obviously Europe has gone through an awful lot of changes in recent years and the events since February have uh, revealed a new element of uh, challenges and crises for the European project. Traditionally, there have been uh, arguments that crisis is the engine of European integration, that uh, Europe uh, integrates faster when challenged. Tonight, we'll be discussing how some of these emergent, old and new challenges are changing the nature of Europe and its relationship with the wider world. So, without any further ado, I'm the uh, MC for this evening. I'm Dr. Russell Foster from EIS, a lecturer in European politics and a senior research fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we're joined by Professor Christoph Meyer, Chair of uh, European Governance, I believe, or European Politics. We'll go with that. Uh, Chair of European Politics, uh, who's going to be uh, discussing um, the, uh, the various crises uh, currently facing the European project with specialism in integration and policy making. We'll then be uh, treated to a speech by um, Professor Sylvia Vassilopoulou, uh, who's recently joined us, a specialist on the far right. Uh, then we will have Dr. Jimena Valdez, uh, a recent recruit to the department, who will be discussing economic change in Europe. And then Dr. Alex Clarkson, lecturer in German and European politics, who will be talking about Ukraine, Europe and NATO. So, without any further ado, I'm actually going to switch off the background slide, because it is dazzling uh, our panel uh, down at the front. So I'm going to turn this off. Uh, and hand over. Each of our speakers will address us for 10 to 12 minutes, then we'll have a few minutes uh, for interaction between the speakers, and then we throw it open to audience Q&A. The bathrooms are out in the uh, foyer if you head towards the lift, and after this event is finished, we're all going downstairs to the arcade where there will be a free reception, which is what, what we're all looking forward to on a cold and dark uh, November evening. So, I shall hand over to Professor Meyer. Thank you very much, uh, Russell, for this introduction. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to um, look back also to the first anniversary event that I was uh, at 10 years ago, because that was a moment of, uh, I think, a profound sense of uh, skepticism, pessimism, and crisis. Uh, 2012, 2013, the, the height of the Eurozone crisis, there was really a sense that Europe uh, was going nowhere, that there were real challenges to the sustainability of the project. And I think from that perspective, it was easy to imagine a different kind of Europe. And I, I just wanted to give you, for um, the next um, couple of minutes or so, that vision of a what-if scenario, a different kind of Europe, where we would have seen Europe develop in a different way. So in that scenario, we would have probably seen um, the pandemic leading to extreme forms of vaccine nationalism where every country tries to produce or resource its vaccine uh, separately, where borders would have been closed uh, permanently, where the economic repercussions of the pandemic would have been very unequal between different, crises, uh, different countries and drive apart the different members of the Eurozone, potentially causing um, Italy to question its, its Eurozone uh, membership, and where there would be a real surge of populist support for exit from Europe or the Eurozone in a number of countries. We would have seen um, a number of countries react quite differently to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where 
some of the member states would have cast a veto against any kind of sanctions against Russia to preserve cheap energy imports and to keep perhaps diplomatic channels with uh, the Putin regime open. Therefore, Europe would not have been able to help in any way uh, Ukraine or where um, there would have been no real punishment for Russia and inhibition of Russia. The commission during that period would have been uh, largely sidelined, play a, a rather, a rather ma minor role, and large member states would meet perhaps outside the EU context to foster and form their own little coalitions and their own uh, solutions. The Eurozone, again, would have been under threat. M one or two countries might have considered, uh, given growing uh, uh, interest rate payments, whether or not they should withdraw. Eurosceptic parties would have made major inroads in the 2019 elections, uh, challenging the kind of pro-European majority. Perhaps France would have had a um, Marine Le Pen as a president, as a kind of hard Eurosceptic. Um, president taking the country into a fundamental renegotiation or perhaps even a, a breakup of, of the EU. So that's the what-if scenario that didn't actually look that implausible in 2013 and certainly in 2016 after Brexit potentially set a precedent for the first large member to leave the EU. However, that is not the Europe of today. The Europe of today is a Europe where, yes, there is contestation of Europe, there is political contestation over Europe uh, as a project, over European integration, and certainly over European policy. But this kind of contestation has become normal. It has become normalized, and Europe has learned to live with that kind of contestation within the existing EU and member state structures. It has learned to adapt and live with populist and anti-EU contestation, as well as the succession of crises that have been facing it over the last 10, 12 years. Indeed, Europe has dealt with these crises, each one of them not creating greater cracks that widen, but instead of just patching up the cracks, Europe has learned to build reform institutions, to adapt policies, mobilizing new resources for European-level crisis management and problem-solving. It has bought vaccines together. It has borrowed for the first time as the EU on financial markets, 800 billion euros, half of them spending them as grants in a redistributive way. It has decided jointly and unan unanimously to impose really harsh sanctions on <coughs> Russia, uh, limiting its ability to wage war, and even if it was economically painful for a number of countries. It also spent two billion pounds on buying weapons for Ukraine, which was really, really very surprising given previous discussions about the European peace facility. And we're also seeing more Europe uh, in the area of justice and home affairs and, and border control. So my sense is that Integration theory, some strands of integration theory, such as new intergovernmentalist account of the EU, perhaps best explain a specific intermediate stage of European integration. A kind of phase of a stepping stone towards Europe becoming more and more like a federal political system, not in the US sense, but in a, in a European sense, where the Commission is acting more like a government, where national heads of state share with their responsibility in leadership through the European Council instead of blaming EU institutions. So I, I get the sense that we're more than halfway through the transition from the old equilibrium of a technocratic Europe, of the community method, towards a new equilibrium um, of uh, a federal states, and where we've left behind a situation where disintegration was perhaps as likely as integration. This transition is clearly not complete without treaty change, but I think the political tectonic plates have moved away. Instead of failing forward, the EU is not performing any worse than what would, could, could be reasonably expected from national governments being faced with these kind of crises. And what we're seeing is cumulative lesson learning from each crisis that then feeds into and creates a precedent for how the EU manages future crises. <coughs> 
So I think lesson learning from crisis is absolutely essential to the way in which the EU has developed in the last couple of years. And in my view, there are perhaps four main overarching lessons that the EU has learned from this succession of crises. The first is that the scale and nature of today's crisis and threats and the changes in global order overwhelm most, if not all, EU member states and do require a European solution or kind of European joint action. There's a strong case for arguing that either European countries swim together or they sink alone. The perception of the Russian war against Ukraine as being a war against Europe just builds on that perception of other threats. So a minimum degree of intra-European solidarity not only has value, but is becoming a real necessity. The second lesson, I think, is that EU, institu the EU institutions, including member states, have demonstrated an ability in crisis management. And I think, importantly, heads of states, member states' governments have learned that they need to engage, they need to shoulder responsibility, and cannot keep blaming EU institutions if things go wrong, because the stakes have gotten too high for uh, the EU to fail. The third realization is that the notion of taking back control comes at a national level, comes at a very high cost, and that promises to leave the EU at the national level are not the vote winner that populist parties uh, were hoping. And finally, at the governmental level, where some populist parties are in government, they've realized that the power of the veto uh, is becoming increasingly less convincing because there are ways in which other governments can bypass that veto with a fiscal compact being just the first example of bypassing vetoes within the EU context. So, to conclude, I don't think that that's, it's a reason to be complacent about the direction of European integration. There's still a chance that the crisis, such as the war over Ukraine, can go in a direction that breaks some of the trust of citizens that leads to a, a, a scenario where Russia wins and where all the sacrifices uh, certainly of Ukrainians, uh, but also the economic sacrifices of Europeans were in vain, where a scenario might develop where a country like France or, or, or Germany are taken over by hard Eurosceptic parties. Um, so in the end, crisis competence and management still matters. Treaty change still needs to happen to populist-proof the European political structure and enhance democracy. But I think we are in, in, a, in a new stage than we were uh, 10 years ago, and that, I think, gives me reason for hope. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Professor Christoph Meyer, uh, and now Professor Sophia Vassilopoulou will discuss uh, the rise of the radical and far right across Europe. Yes, thank you very much, and um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and um, kind of share have the opportunity to share some of my thoughts and I think what I'll be talking about in the next few minutes actually follows really nicely uh, from uh, Christoph's um, intervention. Um, I want to focus specifically on the rise of the far right and the Euroscepticism that has come hand in hand with that uh, phenomenon. And um, the core point I want to make today is that the far right is no longer a marginal force in European politics. It's no longer a marginal force in domestic European politics, the politics of the European Union member states, and it's no longer a marginal force uh, within the European Union itself, right? Be it in terms of European Parliament elections or potential um, uh, participation in the European Council and so on. So that is a very important point because for the past decade or so, there has been a lot of literature on the far right, and the key assumption has been that this is a marginal phenomenon that somehow might be a threat to our democracy, be it again domestic or um, the European Union's democracy, and we need to address it. Now the picture is different. Quite a lot of these parties um, have entered um, governments, and actually entering a government the past few years um, by a far-right party is no longer a shock 
So I remember, I'm old enough to remember that in 2000, uh, the um, Austrian Freedom Party entered the uh, coalition government in Austria with the Conservative Party and uh, all Europeans were in shock, uh, including myself as a student at the time. There was a similar coalition a couple of years ago uh, and there was no shock. Right? If you, if you follow the news at the time, it was, oh yes, and by the way, the FAO is entering a coalition with the Conservatives. And just in terms of kind of reading the mood, right, even from journalists. Um, a very um, interesting example is a very recent example of uh, what is happening in Italy, or what happened in uh, the recent Italian elections, where um, Italy is proud that for the first time they have um, woman, a female prime, uh, prime minister, but equally this uh, female prime minister is actually the leader of a post-fascist uh, political party, the, the Brothers of Italy. So um, we can talk about, uh, perhaps in the Q&A, about how fascist or post-fascist or radical right or far uh, the Brothers of Italy are or are not at the moment, but clearly that is a substantive change in the European political um, landscape. Um, other exa other um, recent examples, uh, Sweden, right? Until a few years ago in Sweden, um, parties had uh, adopted what we call the cordon sanitaire, meaning no one would cooperate ever with the far right. Recently that has changed and actually it's only a month ago that um, a coalition government was formed in Sweden who, which enjoys support uh, from the far right Sweden Democrats. Uh, in a way, the Sweden Democrats, in my opinion, have the best of both worlds because they can influence uh, the government, the governmental decisions, but equally are not 100% within the government. So they can also they can have a, um, a status within and outside the establishment. Um, in other countries, think, let's think about France. We have Marine Le Pen and, and the now renamed uh, um, Rassemblement pour la France, um, the previous uh, Front National Party, came second uh, very recently again. Um, other countries, the far right is in the third place, but still quite an uh, important posi um, position. Basically, there's very few countries in Europe where there is no far right. And again, there is few pa countries where the far right is um, uh, m marginal, right? And clearly there are uh, different patterns per country and there's variation across, uh, ye um, across time, but the pattern means that this is no longer a marginal phenomenon. Now, obviously there would be a, a very important uh, um, issue or challenge for its European democracy and how specific issues such as minority rights, human rights, questions of abortion, uh, social rights, immigration, and so on are addressed domestically. But I want to spend the next few minutes to look at how uh, this um, mainstreamization, as it were, of the far right, um, what that means for, for European integration and European cooperation or international cooperation more broadly. So I would like to focus on that. Now, I think that the war in Ukraine, amongst other things, has um, brought to the forefront that we live in, a, in a, a fractured world, right? That fractured world is crucially also very interdependent, and COVID showed that. I think academics and pundits and journalists would always say that, because there was always a need for international cooperation, but I think for most people, the war in Ukraine and recently COVID actually made this point very, um, very relevant to their everyday lives, right? Now, what does this mean for the far right? This change in international uh, and geopolitical landscape means that they really need to have a, a policy on international cooperation, right? And the fact that they are becoming closer to government every year means that they actually, you know, journalists ask them, ask them that kind of question. At the same time, however, international cooperation does not sit very comfortably with their core um, ideology, which is nationalism. So there are many debates about what defines the far right, but I would say that at least at the very minimum, nationalism is a core defining um, 
feature of their ideology. And what does that mean? It means this idea of preserving the unity, identity, territory of each nation. Now, the European Union has always been portrayed as posing a challenge or a threat to this unity, identity, and territory of each nation. Um, its policies are dim dismant um, sorry, dismantling borders, are dismantling um, the state, they are dismantling the territory. Uh, decision making at the, um, at the international uh, level goes against uh, national sovereignty, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, I have found in my research that uh, the far right defines uh, Europe culturally, um, which actually allows them to make a very interesting and nuanced argument that actually we are in favor of Europe because we are all similar cultures, right? We have uh, common traditions, they always refer to religion, or they, they often refer to religion or Judeo-Christian values and so on. However, it's the European Union that actually doesn't sit comfortably with that. So just to repeat, in terms of ideology, European cooperation doesn't sit comfortably. But ideology is not the only thing that is relevant to political parties. The other um, major consideration is strategic considerations that have to do with party competition and so on. So strategically, they have a, a dilemma. On the one hand, these parties have a very strong incentive to politicize and scapegoat international collaboration along the lines of what Christoph has already mentioned. Um, the point here is that um, over many decades, the mainstream uh, political parties have actually co-opted uh, together in order to create the European Union. They have actually no incentive to talk about European issues, EU, sorry, issues. Therefore, that gives them an angle to politicize something that the mainstream parties do not want to touch upon. So strategically, there are strong incentives to actually talk about the EU a lot and to adopt what we call extreme positions. And what we know from um, uh, comparative research is that indeed, these political parties tend to put forward extreme positions and they tend to talk about these extreme positions quite a lot, right? They increase what we call the salience of this um, issue. Um, that being said, we go on the, si the other side of the dilemma. As I mentioned earlier, these parties go closer and closer to power. And if you are a party in government, assuming office means that actually you, do, you need to make hard choices. And as we have seen um, after Brexit, there is not so much appetite for um, France's exit from the European Union, Frexit, or Nexit, uh, Netherlands exit, or Italo exit, or what have you. There is not so much appetite by the people, but equally, far right parties are reaching closer, are, are approaching positions of power, and actually something like that might be a, um, a very, perhaps not a very good strategic choice. Um, and we know that already, although the far right has been portrayed that uh, they, have, they have, might have had a uniform view of the European Union, actually, they've always been presenting a very nuanced view, which I think over time has become even more nuanced. And in a way, quite often, they try to speak to different audiences um, with this. But what we're seeing now is that mostly these political parties have, um, have shown tremendous ability for uh, adaptability and flexibility, adjusting to current affairs and toning down their anti-EU discourse. That doesn't mean that they're not Eurosceptic, for instance, but it means that potentially they might be pursuing different ways. Um, and I think um, potentially a good role model, as it were, for such parties are people like Orban in, in, in um, Hungary, who is quite Eurosceptic, but equally is a leader, and what he's trying to do is to perhaps change Europe from within, which, as I will also conclude, might potentially be a different kind of challenge for the European Union. These, these uh, people, people like Meloni, will be part of uh, intergovernmental decision making very soon, uh, a long line Orban. The question is, will she continue to imitate Orban, or will she switch and go closer to, say, 
the German position, the French position, and so on. Um, I think I'm going to leave it here, just some kind of food for thought, and um, I'll be very happy to discuss further issues, also about how they see Russia, but I'll leave it for later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vassilopoulou. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Jimena Valdez uh, is going to speak to us on uh, economic inequalities in Europe and particularly some challenges facing uh, working class Europeans. Thank you. Um, so, as Russell said, I study business and labor politics, so I thought I would uh, use the excuse of the economic consequences of the war to talk about unions, to talk about income distribution and political representation. So the invasion of Ukraine by Russia is having direct consequences on the living standards of most Europeans. Europe's dependence on Russia for oil and gas means industries are facing increased costs and, as I'm sure you know, households are having to pay higher prices to heat their homes. So there is a question of how did this dependence come about? It makes sense in economic and perhaps geopolitical terms, this dependence. So, uh, it, was, it was created. And it was also, and I want to highlight this, a project advanced by economic elites. So I want to use my time to talk briefly about the increased importance of economic elites in politics and the decline in trade union representation across Europe. This, I believe, has economic and political correlates that matter, and I want to talk specifically about a worse income distribution and a lack of representation for the working class. And I will end today with a note about current affairs. So let me begin, begin with the elite project. A few prime ministers ago, because things have been moving fast in this country, we would hear things like the British people will understand that sacrifices need to be made uh, to help the people of Ukraine. I'm sure you heard this because it was everywhere. Is having less money month to month something that helps the people of Ukraine? I think uh, despite politicians' best efforts, one could hardly say so. But the relationship between what's happening in Ukraine and our cost of living goes through Russia. Russia is the second biggest exporter of crude oil, the world's largest natural gas exporter. So in the case of the EU, it provides uh, almost 50% of all the gas consumed. In the case of one of the most powerful countries in the, in the European Union, in the case of Germany, this number was even higher. So how did we get there? There is an economic and political rationale for this, right? So German leaders and European leaders thought that increasing trade and creating economic codependency with Russia would have positive political consequences. This could be considered a version of modernization theory, so economic development will bring about democracy, or uh, maybe being less generous, it could be considered wishful thinking. If we treat Russia as an ally, then Russia will act as an ally. So this project was advanced by a select group of German leaders that would act as bridges between German and Russian business. Right? So in some cases, after leaving the German government, they would become uh, kind of lobbyists for Vladimir Putin. So uh, the former chancellor, Gerald Schroeder, has been singled out, but he's far from the only one to do this. Now, this is uh, a very common phenomenon. right? So it's so common that it has a name. It's called revolving doors. The doors between public office and industries are revolving. And some people move pretty easy uh, between positions in one and the other place. Anyone that reads the British news, any British newspaper knows what I'm talking about, right? So I'm not here to discuss whether this was a good or bad idea. Uh, current events would maybe point in the latter direction, that it was not a great idea. But it's also undeniable that Germany and Europe uh, took advantage of cheap gas and oil, power domestic industries, it is foster economic growth. What I want to discuss instead is that the organization and representation of economic elites has no parallel in that of the working classes. And that's not a good thing. So let me talk about the decline of unions. Since the 1980s, trade unions have been declining in most European countries. What do unions do? Very basic question. The obvious function of unions is to negotiate wages, benefits, working conditions, and job security for members. They also affect conditions for non-members, either via extension mechanisms or spillover effects. There is another function that unions have, and that's to, that is to influence public policy. A good deal of protective legislation, the, the legislation that actually protects our jobs and our salaries and our benefits, this comes from the actions of organized labor. So what explains the decline of unions? There is a combination of economic and political changes. There is economic changes, such as increased global competition, the decline of manufacturing, the increase in services, 
um, the increasing non-standard forms of employment, such as those related to the platform economy, that is everywhere. So those are the economic changes. And this happened together with uh, the regulation of labor markets and also a direct attack on the structures of workers' representations. Right? So everything was happening at the same time. Economic changes, political changes, and direct attack on the structures of workers' representation. Why? <coughs> Why was this attack? Well, because according to some, unions are obstacles in a market. Right? So as obstacles, they artificially rise wages, they represent the insiders to the expense of outsiders, and they act as rent seekers. So decreasing their power, according to the people that consider unions to be obstacles, would create economic benefits for everyone, right? for everyone that participates in the labor market. Decreasing their power obviously implied increasing employers' discretion. Right? So a few clarifications about these general trends in the decline of unions. There are differences across countries in the decline of affiliation rates. Scandinavian countries continue to have higher and more stable rates of unionization. Eastern European countries have low and declining rates. There are also differences between Central and Mediterranean countries. But basically what we know from the numbers is that everywhere affiliation rates are lower today uh, than in the early 2000s. Right? Of course, this decline not only varies by country, but it has different consequences according to labor market institutions. In some countries, workers' benefits are tied to union membership. In others, you don't need to be a union member to receive the benefits of what unions negotiate. Now, regarding the smaller role that unions have as political interlocutors, it's safe to say that that's the case everywhere. Right? So is this decline in unionization bad? Should we care about it? Well, to think about that, I'll talk about two contemporary trends that could be related to this decline what's happening with income distribution, and what's happening with political representation. Let me begin with income inequality, income distribution. So income and wealth inequality have increased in Europe since the 1980s, meaning that the top earners capture a higher portion of the total income. Inequality in the region is lower than in the US. I'm sure you listen, you, you have heard this, because uh, Europe likes to think that things are bad, but not as bad. So inequality is lower than in the US, but steadily rising. Inequality in Europe also varies across countries, with some doing worse than others. And thanks to Piketty, we also know that in the US is the land of booming top incomes, but Europe is the land of booming wealth. What are some consequences of the wealthy having that much more than the rest of us? According to the IMF, and note that I'm referencing the IMF and not Che Guevara, inequality could have negative implications for growth and macroeconomic stability, as it concentrates decision-making power in a few hands. This, in turn, leads to a suboptimal use of resources. Uh, this causes political and economic instability. This could lead to lower investment. This could lead to an increase in the chances of crisis. Right? So the IMF is assuming here that an increase in concentration of economic power leads to an increase in concentration of political power, meaning that high levels of income inequality hurt the equal distribution of political power that democracy presupposes. What causes this increase in income inequality? There are a variety of factors, right? Some, some are very general. We have thought about globalization. We have thought about the effects of deindustrialization. We have thought about the race between education and technology. And then there are specific uh, political and institutional explanations. This, this in, ex, um, these explanations are specific to countries. And they also have uh, explanatory power, right? And one of them is precisely the decline in unions. We have empirical evidence that in rich democracies, Unionization is associated with a more compressed wage distribution and with reduced top income shares. Right? Now, we also have evidence that this relation has weakened in the last 20 years. There's another correlate to the decline of unions, and that has to do with political representation. Right? So I talked about income distribution. Now I want to talk about political representation. In these years, workers in Europe have lost political representation. With the exclusion of unions in the workplace, workers have less power, or they have a representation that is only formal, but not substantive, right? A representation that doesn't really go uh, anywhere. The marginalization and legitimization of unions also has consequences at the level of national political representation, where unions could have positive effects on citizen engagement and on public policy. What we're witnessing then is a weakening of class-based channels for workers' concerns, right? They, have, they are losing those channels to express their concerns. So, Remember, I mentioned that, the, that leaving unions aside was this specific project to get rid of obstacles in market, right? Of, of what was considered an obstacle in the market. 
Did this lead to increased economic benefits for all workers, as it was supposed to? Or did this, this, this lead to social harmony? I don't think so, right? One could hardly say so. Instead, I think there are two emerging phenomena that are related to the exclusion of unions. One is uh, varied and disorganized social protest. Right? People still have grievances, people still have concerns, people are still unhappy. They take to the street. They just do it without the institutional channeling they had before. One case in point was the Yellow Vest protest in France. We saw then that uh, there were protests and the government did not have an institutionalized interlocutor to deal with. Um, these people were, were raising issues, there were pressing issues to solve, but they didn't have anyone to talk to to negotiate a solution. So the absence of organizations that can articulate these concerns politically, so the, un the absence of, of unions may lead to disorder and may lead to anti-system politics instead of economic dynamism and social peace, which was supposed to happen after unions were marginalized. The other phenomenon I want to mention um, that Sofia has addressed is the rise of the far right. There's an enormous amount of research trying to understand why people vote for radical right parties. Part of those studies point at supply side factors, right? What Sophia was saying about how they uh, increase the, the salience of some issues. So there are these parties that increase the salience of some issues, and I have I, I have to wonder about the void left by unions as organizations that help voters make sense of what was happening, right? Of what was happening in the world. Unions had that role before, and now there is a void, and that void is being fi filled by others with different and much more exclusionary interpretations. So let me end the talk with a comment about a very current topic, inflation, recession, and who is going to bear the worst part of all this. So prices are going up, and we all wonder what's going to happen with our wages. So let me show the two dimensions of the decline of, in unions here. The first one is that there is lower bargaining power for workers, right? When it's time to negotiate yearly increases in our salaries, weaker or no unions means that workers will have a harder time maintaining our purchasing power. The second one is that there is no one to respond to, for example, the governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey. In early February, Bailey tweeted that we do need to see a moderation of wage prices. Now that's painful. I don't want to, in any sense, sugar that. It's painful. But we need to see that in order to get through this problem more quickly. He was not alone in saying things like this. Olivier Blanchard, who was the head of the IMF during the financial crisis, and he's a professor of economics at the MIT, he tweeted in July of this year that in the current context of commodity and energy prices causing inflation, as opposed to as a scenario, he said, of inflation coming from overheating, right? The current scenario of is of these commodity and energy prices causing inflation. He said it was even harder to explain to workers why they had to lose their jobs. Why should I lose my job because Putin invaded Ukraine? Blanchard thought that people may wonder. He finished his thread reflecting on the difficulties for the job and communication strategy of central banks. A journalist of the Financial Times, Martin Sandbu, pointed to the obvious issues and problems in Bailey's reasoning. He tweeted, genuine question. Why does the governor of the Bank of England encourage restraint in wage demands, but not call for restraint in business attempts to protect their profit margins? Intellectual bias, ideology, greater resignation with reference to price and wage setting or something else. So at the Bank of England rises interest rates and workers are asked to make sacrifices. We know that household, in household income sorry, will be squeezed and we can only wonder about the missing voice of workers' organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valdez. And now to, uh, to uh, give us our final speech, um, Dr. Alex Clarkson will be discussing the relationship between Ukraine, Europe, and NATO, uh, and uh, Ukraine's survival in the ongoing war. Right, uh, thank you very much. And actually, what I'm going to present, uh, as you know, I see I haven't got any notes, I've done this now. Presentation now, I think that's the 12th one. Um, because these issues have been in demand, but I think they also help us reflect a little bit, not just about Ukraine, Ukraine's position, uh, in Europe, but it also gives us some lessons about how the EU as an institution, how European institutions interact with the world around them. Um, and I think also it's a lot of what's happening in Ukraine can also gives us some, some space to reflect about developments in Europe. Ukraine has always has frequently been uh, portrayed as a peripheral society.
But if you actually look back at Ukraine's history over the last two or three hundred years, it's been the avant-garde, it's been an innovator. A lot of what happens in Ukraine happens in the rest of Europe a little bit later. And I think in many ways there are also a lot of lessons to be learned uh, here in less uh, innovative and less dynamic political cultures in Western Europe to learn from developments in Ukraine and get, get, that give us a bit of a sense of how things may be going <coughs> over two over the next couple of years. So to start off with the presentation, I think that one of the interesting, fascinating aspects of what we've seen in the crisis, in, the repeated several crises in Ukraine since 1990, is that a lot of what has driven escalation there have been uh, miscommunication and misreading of neighboring societies. And that's, there's three case studies of this in this context. First is the EU's misreading and miscommunication with Ukraine and Russia. The second case study is Russia's misreading and miscommunication with Ukraine and the EU. And the third case study is Ukraine's misreading of Russia and misunderstanding of dynamics in Russia itself. I think, you know, there are a lot of very interesting and great historians to study Ukraine's relationship with the rest of Europe. There's Timothy Snyder is doing a great uh, lecture series for Yale that you can access on YouTube uh, that deals with the last 2,000 years of Ukraine history. There's Sergei Plochi, there's Roman Shvorluk, there's Anna Bolian, or as tell me, there's a lot of people you can read about it, so I'll skip that. I'll skip the last 2,000 years and go straight for the last 30 years. And I think one of the interesting dynamics in the build-up to the Maidan uprising that began in uh, November 22, so the yeah, anniversary is coming around now, November 22 of 2013, is the extent to which European policymakers misread dynamics in Ukrainian society and misread and misunderstood dynamics within the Russian elite in response to Ukrainian society. And I, I, I experienced this personally. I think I lost count of the times between October 2013 and um, eight, March uh, 2014 when EU policymakers, European diplomats, European employees of various European agencies would assure me and assure other academics who've been working on, in my case, the Ukrainian diaspora for a very long time, that Ukrainians wouldn't fight. That Ukrainians would not resist if the Russians came in. This Ukrainian identity, that's something you find in Halichina and Bukovina, maybe in Vano Frankivsk, Vinitsia, okay, maybe. But this is something that's not held strongly enough in Ukraine. It's a post-Soviet society. There was a notorious PowerPoint presentation circulated within the European government, a German government, called Ukraine Inc. Ukraine GmbH, and this was done by the internal experts in Auswärtiges Amt and a German agency, explaining that Ukraine isn't really a country. This is done within German government circles, but it's actually a set of different competing industrial clans that will be easily bought out and they'll be easily subordinated by Russia in this process. This is tremendously frustrating because anybody who knew developments on the ground knew that Ukrainians would fight. Right, so one of the interesting dynamics in that process was seeing how, and there were many European policymakers that were aware of developments on the ground. There were many diplomats that were about, develop, aware of developments on the ground. The German and the Italian and French context, it was almost an interesting generational case study. There was a generation of policymakers with the key decision making points at the very top whose experience of the former Soviet space was framed in the 1980s and early 1990s. And yeah, if you are a diplomat, or an ambassador, or, a or somebody working for a European agency who experiences a Ukraine in the early 1990s, and the mid-1980s, particularly the push by the late 1990s, yes, you can see how that develops a certain kind of skepticism about the resilience of this state, about the extent to which this state would resist Russian encroachments, and the extent to which various different oligarchic clans, which is a very crude term for a very complex set of industrial political relations that go from the bottom to the top of Ukrainian society, you can see how, if you see this from the perspective of 1993 and 1994, you come to the conclusion that Ukraine will fall. And so one of the first lessons I think that we need to draw from this is the extent to which European institutions, be they on a European member state level, or the EAS, have to work harder at being, and I know this is a terrible cliche, learning institutions. Because this is not just a problem in relation to Ukraine. I, to, because I work on, the, I do half of my work on diasporas, the other half of my work is on the militarization of the EU's borders. I think there's like a European strategic culture emerging from the way the EU interacts with all these neighboring states in very interesting ways. How the EU interacts with Vucic has great parallels with how it interacts with somebody like Palbia and Cameroon, right? which isn't really thought through about how this is strategic culture developing that is problematic. One of its characteristics, at least in the Ukrainian case, was the extent to which it was not a learning culture. The extent to which you were dealing with institutions that developed <coughs> a set understanding of societies around them that shaped policy-making processes that were profoundly unresponsive to visible changes in the political economy of these societies. The Ukrainian political economy 
in 2014 is radically different from that of 1993. Right? There is a new generation. There are a whole set of different new industrial sectors, different political actors, different uh, people with a lot of money, and not just civil society. There's also a kind of an incipient trade union movement, that, which is a very complex relationship with these kind of oligarchic and new money structures. And they're coming up, and they are less invested in this relationship with Russia. They are more patriotic in Ukrainian. You can see this in the Ukrainian military. Valery Zavuzhny, the current Ukrainian head of general staff, the man commanding, he's called the Iron General. Now, um, he's a good man, he made some mistakes, but he's a good man. Um, but he is the first of a generation of senior Ukrainian officers that never served in the Soviet army. You go to the SBU, the HUR, Budanov, all of the senior figures of the Ukrainian political and military structure are post-Soviet. Yet until 2014, 2015, the analytical framework of many people in European institutions towards Ukraine was this of a still Soviet society. Right? And you can see this with Cameroon, one of my opposite ends of the map. You can see conceptual frameworks based on a model that's known as France Afrique, affecting not just French but EU policy making, making big mistakes, just opposite end of the map, in ways that are interestingly parallel mistakes made to Ukraine because there is a framework European policymakers are using towards a dynamic society. A static view of a dynamic society means that the EU will be eternally blindsided by changes that were visible to people closer to the ground. Right? So that's a lesson for the EU. We also know, I'm not going to go into great details about the way the EU mis misread the Russian elite and the Russian elite's um, relationship with Ukraine, but again, this idea that there is a dynamic development in Russia, Russia in 2000 is where Russia is in 2014 or in 2022, that's a mistake. I'll spend less time on Russia's misreading of Ukraine because it sort of mirror images the EU's. Right? So you have a Russian understanding, or a Russian elite understanding, that is not just about Vladimir Putin. That permeates MGIMO, which is one of the, the core higher education institutions in Moscow that shapes the policy making and policy thinking of the entire Russian generation. But you have a misreading of changes in Ukrainian society, very deeply embedded cultural and historical narratives in the Russian elite that assume a level of cultural closeness between Ukraine and Russia and ignore the way in which, for every Ukrainian region, there are also alternate cultural fixed points. The South is heavily influenced by Ottoman Turkish influences and a certain relationship with Southeastern Europe. The West, obviously, the Habsburg tradition. Kharkiv has its own trading and cultural relations with Turkey and the Black Sea as well. Right, so you know, that's the story I'm not going to go into great detail. And of course, there's the long influence of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth that you find in all aspects of Ukrainian society, even in Donetsk. Luhansk, and of course a particular Crimean political configuration. That's not to underestimate the extent to which Ukraine still has strong ties to Russia. Of course Russia is hugely influential to Ukrainian society, but Ukrainian society has historically, and in the 1990s and noughts, as a post-Cold War dynamic, that also leads to interesting business and political links to Turkey in itself, or the EU, or the United States and Canada, Ukraine is both deeply linked with Russia, but also linked with all kinds of other societies that draw it in different directions that were not accounted for in the Russian context. And the Russian context simply underestimated the extent to which this is a distinct society in which there's a mix of both cultural patriotism, but also concrete financial incentives to resist. If you are a mayor in a city like Nikolaev, or the governor of Nikolaev, like Vitaly Kim, he's the coolest half Korean, he's kind of a hardcore guy, he's now a hero, He's also made a lot of money through property deals and so on, right? But, you know, for that person, Vitaly Kim, faced with the decision of falling to the Russians or keeping going, he had the choice between submitting to Moscow and acceding to a system that will give him a lot of money but no power, or having less money as a Ukrainian but having more power. Because the system, Ukrainian society is a political system, the society is a decentralized society. The Russians must read that. Final misreading is the Ukrainians themselves. The Ukrainians thought they understood the Russians better than everyone else. For the same, almost a mirror imaging of this misunderstanding from Moscow. Right up until a week before the war, he would have senior Ukrainians saying, we have a war plan, because obviously the Russians will never invade us with just 190,000 troops. It's crazy. It was crazy. It was nuts. It was obviously nuts. They sent less troops to invade Ukraine than they used, the Soviet Union used against Czechoslovakia, a country of 10 million people. Ukraine had 44 million people. It was obviously crazy. So people like Valerius Zeluzhny would be sitting there saying, I've read all of the kind of Russian military literature. They're obviously much smarter than this. They're not crazy. 
Basically, the Ukrainians developed a super complex plan about how this was about it. It would be standoff strikes and limited attacks and internal destabilization. And it was a very smart plan for the wrong war. Because the Russians did, in the end, invade. So in a sense, the Ukrainians made all the same mistakes the Russians and the EU made towards them. The Ukrainians made the same mistakes towards Russia. They didn't understand Russia was in a dynamic position where things were changing. In a sense, the Ukrainians made the mistake of thinking the Russians were much smarter than the Russians really were engaging in this invasion. Some final points. Just as we, in the past, here in the EU, and I'm speaking we in the EU because I think the UK will eventually become part of the team again, but that's a different debate. But just as we have in the past made mistakes about misreading the dynamism of these societies around us, we have to keep watching for the dynamism of these societies. Both in the Russian context, we fixate too much on Putin. In some ways, whether he falls or not is irrelevant. I know that sounds a bit heretical. What matters is how does the system reconfigure itself below him? Anybody who worked on Yemen, probably not many people here in the knots, will know that a, a tyrant can last for a very, very long time, yet the system below them changed radically. Ali Abdullah Saleh, he eventually did die and fall, but for ages, everybody kept predicting he would fall, he never would, but everything was changing beneath him. So whether Putin falls or not is clearly relevant. It depends on how the social contract between elites is rewritten within Russia. What happens to Prigozhin? I think if the war, if they stay in a state of eternal war, Prigozhin rises to the top through this power state organization called Wagner. If not, he falls. Interesting question. Final point, Ukraine. That's also a dynamic society. That's changing rapidly. Ukraine now is not the same country it was a year ago. It's a society going through a radical form of militarization. Right? With long-term consequences for Ukrainian society. I'm a half Ukrainian. I'm, a lot of this is a bit like, well, hey, you know, patriotism. I'm wearing a, a St. Javelin t-shirt below this jumper, right? On the other hand, I sort of miss the old Ukraine, where things didn't really matter much. The belly pop Ukraine, where it was a civilian society. So coming back to some of the points on the radical right and trade unions, like one of the things we have to think about in the future is how do we re -civilian, help re-civilianize Ukrainian society so it's a functional democracy? That doesn't mean that I think Ukraine will fall into dictatorship, but it's going to be a militarized society if this keeps going. So how, do we, how trade unions can play a crucial role in re-civilianizing a society after a war? And what happens to the whole idea is that Ukraine is actually avant-garde about it, about Europe and the far right. What well, Ukrainian far right is complicated because it does exist, but it doesn't necessarily conform to our ideas of what a far right should be. I like to think of Ukrainian far right as a kind of starship trooper as authoritarianism where you have a lot of ex-Nazis involved, but they're still ending up fighting with Jews and Crimean Tatars, so that doesn't work, because the guy next to you is Jewish, and if you insult him like a Nazi, you'll die. So how do you reconceptualize this? And this idea that in this Heinlein book, citizenship through service, doesn't matter what background you are or whatever, as long as you accede to a Ukrainian model of civic identity, but in a highly authoritarian, militarized concept, where the Ukrainians see themselves as the defense of Europe, because we're worthless bastards, and they're dying for us, so it's also framed in terms of Europeanism, in the defense of European civilization. I think that model of a kind of far-right ideology is an interesting forerunner of what we might have not here over time if we don't help re-civilianize Ukrainian society in a post-war effort that recognizes that this is not a static society, it's a dynamic society. Right? And that's been a huge problem in our policy making right up until now. So thank you very much. Uh, to Dr. Alex Clarkson and to all of our panelists. So we've got uh, 30 minutes. So what we'll do now is we'll hand it over to some audience uh, Q&A. So I'll uh, moderate and direct the questions to the front. So the floor is yours. Would anyone like to ask a question? Oh dear. Ah, <laughs> excellent. Uh, let's take two or three at a time. So the gentleman at the back and then the lady in red. Um, hi, my name's Alex. Um, I had a question for Dr. Alex Clarkson, um, referenced the, his comment on re-civilization of Ukraine. Just wondering if you could go maybe a bit more uh, into detail about that, what you think that could look like, what the European Union, you know, what policies they could bring about. I'd just be interested to hear a bit more about that. Thank you. Uh, and we'll take uh, yourself as well. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm Anna Matveeva. I'm the in red here. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Russia Institute. And my question is, um, Sophia, maybe to you. Um, uh, maybe about a connection between far-right parties in, in Europe and uh, Russia. Uh, Alex, do you want to I think that one of the difficulties the EU will face is that what the EU does in these situations, and certainly did to countries like Croatia and Slovenia, not completely successfully in the case of Croatia, but certainly as part of that package, 
is to generate a sense of incentives through access to the EU system, right? Through the, the kind of EU membership or EU integration packages. The problem the EU faces is, is that out of a legitimate response in the week after the war started, a lot of what would be the incremental set of incentives the EU has, access to the single market, drops of quotas and tariffs, uh, support for Ukrainian institutions, military reform, freedom of movement, those, Ukraine is basically already part of the, the I mean, it's a sort of de facto member of the EEA now, European Economic Area. It's like Norway, because out of emergency means. There is no way after this war is over that any of those measures are going to be rolled back. I mean, we, 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 it's always said, oh, this is a temporary process. Many things in the EU system are temporary that become permanent. Ukraine is now permanently a full member of the single market. That's done. That's over. So the only thing we really have left to offer is full membership. And so if we want to speak of a re-civilianization, I'm not talking about Ukraine becoming a dictatorship. I do worry that Ukraine becomes something like a Likud division of Israel. Right? That you have this highly militarized society, anybody who becomes... That's why it's changed radically. This is no longer a, a country of oligarchs, this is a country of generals. And colonels, and majors. Like anybody who will have rank and status in Ukrainian society, many women as well, by the way, because it's, there's a high ratio of, of, of gender involvement, women's involvement in the military. A lot of LGBT people, too. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the whole LGBT movement becomes like, did you serve? Right? So, in that kind of context, you have a highly militarized society with a certain, also a certain mindset of how you approach Russia, which is, I mean, there is a, what you call the Ukrainians have a military intelligence service called the HUR, and their mentality is basically, we'll just blow stuff up in Russia, and the EU will thank for us for it later. That's not necessarily what you want in a post-war scenario. So I think there's an issue here about what incentives. And unfortunately, the only, well, not fortunately, I, I think it's good if the Ukraine becomes, but the only final incentive the EU has towards Ukraine is membership. That's going to be, have to help there. And whether the EU likes it or not, if it wants this country to go back to a re-civilianized order and have all the civil society aid and trade union aid, you're going to have to have that core acknowledge that this is where this is going. If you, cause all the other incentives that you used to have, like single market, all that, that's gone, it's done. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Sophia. Yes, thanks for the question. I. Um, I wasn't sure whether I should cover that in the presentation or in the Q&A, so I think that, um, that, is, that is a very, very um, interesting question, very good question that goes at the heart of um, flexibility point that I was making earlier. Now, Russia, I think, was always used in order to attack the European Union, right? Because I think generally the decisions that the far right is, is making with regards to international cooperation are quite often strategic. And of course, Russia has a specific kind of way of governance that is not that different to what some of these parties might, might want, the idea of strong leadership and so on. Now, the war in Ukraine has made the, the far right uncomfortable, in a way, and um, the, a very um, uh, interesting example is that actually the, the war broke just uh, maybe a few days after Marine Le Pen issued her uh, manifesto before the elections this year, and one of, uh, uh, was it the second page of the manifesto, had a, um, gray, um, sorry, a big picture of her um, shaking hands with uh, Putin, and uh, guess what, she had to withdraw the manifesto, uh, because it was un unfortunate for her that the, the war um, uh, uh, just erupted a couple of days after she printed it. So um, Le Pen has gone to Crimea, she has done all sorts of things, and so has Salvini. So for this, uh, Salvini of the, the um, Italian League. So for these two specific parties, has been a, a big problem. Um, now, Meloni perhaps exercised a level of foresight and was, was never anti-Putin, uh, sorry, uh, pro-Putin, she never put forward any of these ideas. It is potentially the case that she wanted to differentiate herself uh, from Berlusconi, uh, who is much more Russiaphile, and Salvini, uh, I think it remains to be seen whether this is going to be a bone of contention, because I, I think she has made statements along the lines of we are supporting our European partners in this, and Salvini and Berlusconi have probably refrained from making comments. So I guess it's just another example where we do see some level of flexibility, but also where we see strategic use of current affairs in order to make their case. Further questions? Don't be shy. Gentleman at the front, and then uh, the lady in the jacket. 
Yeah, thanks. That's really interesting. I think my question to everybody, um, you missed a crisis, um, climate change, which I think affects everything you talked about. So when we, when, if we eventually do deal with put the measures in place we need to, to deal with the effect of the economy and unions and, and the far right. But I also want, so I'd like to see your comments on that, but I also think with the war in Ukraine, it's maybe accidentally also forcing Europe to make some of those decisions about breaking away from gas and, and oil that is pushing us in the right direction. So I'd just be curious to see what you, sort of how you think. Thank you. I'll we'll take a second question as well and then we'll answer the two more ones. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, my question was really around um, post-war in Ukraine and the reason that I wanted to talk about it was um, if we draw a relation to the interwar years and the Great Depression that happened in the UK, um, there's a lot of sources and a lot of reason to suggest that the rise in unions had quite an impact in that um, political and I suppose economic issues in the interwar years. My question really is, with that as a case study, what benefit does increased levels of unions have on a country like Ukraine post the war? Thank you. Um, let's take those two. Uh, Christoph, do you want to start us off? Yeah, on, on um, climate change, um, The word crisis is, is overused, I think, across a different, different range of scenarios. I think there, there needs to be a bit more, I think, sensitivity in terms of what is the severity of the crisis and how it is experienced by different um, actors within government. So I think uh, what is labeled a crisis in news media coverage is not often a crisis for civil servants and how civil servants experience it in terms of the, the levers that they can pull or, or politicians feeling a real urgency to act. And, and I would certainly agree with you that, that climate change is, is, is a major threat um, to, well, to all sorts of different, different um, goods that we value, but I don't think yet we are in a, in a crisis management mode and we don't, that the EU is not experiencing crisis in that way. Um, it is, however, framing uh, its new budget, the, the, the multi-annual financial framework, a key part of that budget is, is the green transition. So I think the EU is at the forefront of certainly doing some of the right things to address the crisis. And I think in some ways with the um, uh, fallout from the, the Russian war in Ukraine, there is a sense that we, that Europe needs to act together, not only to secure its, its energy uh, supplies, but also to make that transition much more quickly than it maybe had thought before. So I think again there is a sense of perhaps symmetric lesson learning that this transition is something that needs to be resourced and driven through the EU and it's not something that can be done by individual member states alone. Thank you. Uh, can I? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So I think I mean, I think I would say two things, one on the side of business and one on the side of, of labor. I think uh, it's clear in, in what I mentioned, but in general, that the role of business and vested interests has had kind of a, a very relevant role in explaining why the economy works in certain ways. Anyone who was in the city today saw the immense amount of cars that exist in London still. Why is that? I can't understand. So basically, I think the role of interest groups, the, the connections to politicians, and, 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 and the reduced role of unions certain, certainly, I think, explains part of why we're still uh, running so much behind with the issue of climate change. Um, I think trade unions have a role to play, and I think it's double. One is uh, supporting this transition and, and, and kind of you know, taking that, let's say, taking that as a as something that they propose and that they can they can say, but also in supporting the people that are going to lose in that transition, right? The workers that are in industries that are going to uh, have to reduce their importance, and and I think that's very important because uh, I think it's similar to what happened with globalization. The idea it was going to be good for everyone, uh, but we missed that there were going to be some losers, right? And that those losers uh, that went without compensation then had concerns, then had grievances, and then voted as they, as they voted, maybe for the far right, maybe for populists. So I think unions have a role both in 
kind of taking this as, a, as, a, as something they want, but also supporting and making sure that no one uh, becomes a loser on that transition. Thank you. Sophie? Yes, I just wanted to uh, briefly intervene on the um, climate uh, point from the point of view of how the far right is looking at it. And I should say I am contemplating on um, including a week on this topic in my far right politics module. And the environment as a topic is what we call a valence topic, meaning it's, you can deny that uh, climate change is happening or so on, but in terms of the environment, you cannot make a negative argument. You cannot say, I'm not going to uh, be um, making the argument that I, I like pollution, as it were, right? So you can't do that. Um, obviously, the environment, at least at the core of the far right, is not something that they are particularly interested in, but at the same time, it's becoming more salient and there's something that needs to be addressed. What they've done, which I think is very um, smart in a way, is to associate the environment um, with immigration and essentially use the issue of the environment to continue this anti-immigration uh, message. So um, a very good example of that is the point of green beds, right? So uh, how the argument goes, having more immigration means we need more housing. To address the issue of more housing, we, we need to build in our green beds. So therefore, immigration makes it very difficult for us to address the issue of climate and so on. So I think it's a very good example of how you can turn an issue and appropriate it within your existing kind of um, ideological belief um, now, whether this is convincing, I think some people do believe in this. And, and in a way, their argument is, uh, I'm not a climate denier. I, I actually, I, th I think it is happening. But we can address it by reducing the levels of immigration, right? Which some would say is potentially not the best way of addressing it. I, I think I'll start with the issue of the trade unions. And trade unions are, play a central role in, in, in a balanced social political order. And if you're looking at a post-war Ukraine, or a post-war Russia, I mean, that's maybe further down, down the track, then having these forms of worker representation are key to re-civilianizing a society. I mean, if you have a highly militarized society where you have every aspect of political identity is structured through what role you play in the military, so it doesn't shift your service, then you have maybe a limited set of channels that shape and frame political discourse. If you have a vigorous trade union movement, Ukraine has a vigorous worker activism culture. The first people the Russians attacked when they infiltrated Donetsk and Luhansk were worker activists. Because Donbas traditionally had a very strong worker activism culture. At very weak central trade unions, the traditional negotiation between Ukrainian working class and Ukrainian management was not to go to a central trade union, but localize workers to burn down a local manager's car and threaten his family. And then you'd have a negotiation. Um, it's often pretty effective. But again, that points to humanist problem that you don't have a strong system, so this is chaotic and doesn't actually lead to national or, or wider transnational effects. So trade unions are central to this process, and I think that any process should focus on a situation where you have a strong Ukrainian military, but with a particular form of civil military relations. We have also all kinds of different alternative nexuses of power in Ukraine society, trade unions, civil society, business associations, because that's how you re-civilianize society while having still having a strong military. On the climate change point, a briefer point, I think we're still in the mindset of Climate change is coming, nothing is happening, we're all going to die. And I think the problem with that is actually a lot is happening. We are already seeing a restructuring of the political economy around Europe. With, and it's also affecting the behaviors, for example, of the Saudi government. I think a lot of what's driving MBS is this fear that they're going to run out of money as investment capital and investment shifts on. And he has this feeling that he has to assert Saudi power because otherwise he's screwed in 30 years' time. He probably is. Right? And you can see this in the um, assertiveness of MBZ and UAE. This is going to completely... So I think we have to start thinking about the fact that this is already happening, and these have all kinds of geostrategic second-of-order effects around Europe, where money goes from one set of revenue streams, for all set of regimes, from Algeria to Cameroon to you know, so uh, to another different set of revenue streams. And that changes the structures of power. Usually when this happens, a lot of violence happens. People think they're running out of time. One argument why Putin struck now is he was, felt that he was running out of time for a number of different reasons. You know, also, the, his political economy faced eventually, in fact, a restructuring away from gas and oil. So better strike now while you have the cash. And then there are other actors, authoritarian, non-authoritarian, that are going to stand to make a lot of money. 
So we have to, again, be a learning organization, us, Europeans, EAS, diplomats, intelligence service, whatever, and start thinking not just what's happening there, but three, four steps down the track, when these revenue streams start shifting around, people start reacting in ways that will be violent. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, time for a few more. Uh, okay, we've got the gentleman and the lady at the front. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, good evening. Um, <coughs> I understand from my uh, view that the you know, EU has actually you know, formed as a normative power over, over the years who has actually you know, um, uh, put forth a lot of you know, policies, uh, pushed for, uh, to the global south as well. Some are, some are good and some are bad. But do you see that you know, the imminent uh, war and crisis which it is actually you know, seeing in this theater uh, has actually you know, created uh, its focus to you know, go, uh, uh, go less in uh, various other issues like what uh, the interactions and uh, negotiations which they are actually you know, doing with, uh, let's say for example, the Indo-Pacific uh, 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 region or the Global South dialogues or the interactions with the latter markets. Thank you. Uh, I'll let you yeah. So I had a question for Professor Papunopoulou, I think, and sorry for the name, but also for everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is basically if you think that the emergence of far-right movements that is being like current everywhere in Europe and it has like steadily, steadily increasing, is going to break its way into the Euro like European Union, or you think that the institutions will, will be able to, in the long run, to tone down uh, the far-right movements and their consent across society? And also, my, um, on a related topic, I wanted to ask if, uh, to Professor Valdez if you think that um, the fact that trade unions have become less uh, effective across society is kind of one of the reasons why the working class is consistently voting more for far right, pa for right parties than it used to vote for left parties in the past. Thank you. Um, who on the panel would like to start us off? Let's take uh, him in, you <laughs> yeah, I can only respond to the second question, my knowledge. Um, so first of all, I want to say that your question to Sophie, I think, goes well for a dissertation. I would say that I'm not a specialist. Maybe someone has already seen if they are, uh, if the far right is in the EU institutions, but I think that's a very interesting question to explore. So the other thing is, um, there is so much research on the far right. Sophia knows much more than me, and there are so many explanations for why people are voting for the far right. Uh, some point out economic grievances, right? So unemployment, uh, losers of globalization, and these type of things. Others point more to cultural grievances, such as I don't like immigrants. I don't understand why I have to, uh, why women now are everywhere doing whatever they want and all that. And and they are related to also cultural grievances are related to economic grievances. So it's hard to say is it is it the decline of unions, right? But definitely, I think um, what I was what I mentioned briefly in, in my presentation is that there is this, this thing of, of now, uh, so of supply side explanation, right? So people have concerns and instead of going to uh, a union meeting or going to the pub, there's a paper written about the decrease in pubs as a place of social gathering and as a place where people make sense of stuff here in Britain, how that affects the vote for the far right actually. So having, not having that place of the union means that I'm uh, I guess, available for other discourses, right? And one possible discourse is the far right. Is people telling me your problems are, have to do with immigrants, your problem has to do with women doing whatever. And so wh I do think that, that unions had this power of explaining things, uh, of helping people also, because unions actually work for your salary, work for your benefits. They also had a, 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 but they also had a place of not only, you know, a, a better wage, but the social activities, right? And, and also, uh, sitting on the table and discussing national pol national politics, right? They used to be part of um, just discussing economic policies, so labor policies, and and so I think that when unions take a step back, other actors are taking that that are a step forward, right? And among those are the far right. Yeah, um, perhaps two two quick quick answers. I think it's it's true to say that. Um, Europe has, and certainly the EU institutions, have, have realized that not having a strategy towards, um, uh, you know, towards Africa, towards the Indo-Pacific and so forth, is, is no longer uh, feasible, that they need to engage with these uh, different partners across the world, and that they are starting from uh, a, 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 um, a deficit in terms of perception. I think 
the war in Ukraine has, I think, shown how much resonance there is in certain parts of Africa for the Russian narratives uh, feeding into uh, resentment about uh, colonialism, neo-colonialism, and so forth, in the sense that maybe uh, the EU's talk about partnership hasn't always lived up to reality. Um, but I think there's also a sense that, yes, um, our narratives are not uh, convincing, but therefore we do need to change policy. So, for instance, the Global Gateway Initiative is exactly designed as a kind of counterweight to the Belt and Road uh, Initiative to kind of create um, some sort of sovereignty for these countries, not make them indebted, and make some sort of EU offer, European offer to these countries, and kind of change direction. Because I think Europe realizes that even together with the US, it no longer has the influence it had in the early 2000s or 1990s. It needs more allies, it needs access to uh, raw materials, to supply chains, it needs more political support. So it needs to forge new alliances, and that is a strategic endeavor. And therefore, I, I think that is part of the EU's response to um, that uncertainty and the, kind of the, the, the challenges to global order and liberal order. And I think that leads also to the point about what is, what is the prospect of the, the, the far right taking over uh, EU institutions and EU political order. Um, I think my, my talk was more about, in a sense, the state of integration, the state of the EU, and, and the prospect for disintegration of the EU polity as a whole. It doesn't mean that the EU will stay as liberal as it has always been. I think it's part of the, the far right becoming more mainstream part of the political discourse and therefore EU actors, EU parties need to learn how to um, develop their own strategies to counter those narratives of the far right. And some of that is more discourse and communication, but some of that is really policy. If you cannot solve some of the grievances um, that drive support for the far right, you have a problem. And I think the EU has realized over time that there are some problems they just do need to um, address, they do need to solve through policy, through resources. And um, if they can do that, then I think they will not um, drive the far right back to where it was 10 or 15 years ago, but I think they, they can keep the far right from taking over the constitutional order and changing in fundamental ways the nature of what the EU is about. Just, just two brief points. I think, um, I think the Indo-Pacific context is different, just from saying African or Sahelian specific context. This discourse of the Europe being and the EU being a normative power doesn't sit comfortably with the realities of the ground. The EU seems a normative power from, say, the perspective of Brussels, DC, or Beijing, or Delhi. Um, but if you've been shot in the head by Carabinieri special forces because of various security initiatives related to anti-terror and border control, driven by this border dynamic of the EU, that doesn't feel very normative, right? So I think there is a tendency, has been a tendency to understand, estimate the extent to which a lot of what the EU does, and a lot of that shapes EU actions, is actually heavily weighted and based on the use of hard power in pretty ruthless ways. And I, I think that reminds me of, of, of uh, Pierre Trudeau's quote about the United States, like sleeping next to an elephant, like Canadians or Mexicans, like in the, every twitch and move, the elephant itself doesn't feel, you feel, Right, if you're in the same bed as an elephant. And that's for all these other states around it. A lot of what the EU does isn't normative, it's pretty hard power focused. And that's where a lot of that, I think the EU is often not aware of this. It's often blind to what its own actions actually lead to. And I think a second part of the far right, I think there is no automatic contradiction between European integration and far right racism. We always assume that because far right movements until now have framed themselves in national terms. You can perfectly well viably see, and I think this is where Azov is a forerunner. Not the unit that's more complicated, but the specific movement. There's two distinct entities in Ukraine. Although many people in the unit are connected, it's complicated. But Azov's reframed itself as a very old Ukrainian nationalist trope. You also find Poland in Finland, in the Baltics, in Romania. That we East Europeans, they say East Europeans, are Europe's sword and shield. Right? We are engaged not just in the defense of Ukraine, but the gates of Europe. We're defending. Europe and Europeans, and we are defending Europeans from the jungle, Borel, and the barbarians outside. And you can have a very militarized and very sort of compelling far-right narrative that embraces European integration, says we're doing this 
because the world outside is a world of eternal war, and to preserve our pace of peace, we must have a space of peace within Europe, we must be constantly willing to fight outside and kill anyone who threatens us. That's a very far-right discourse that you do find in different parts of the far-right in Europe. It's very well developed in Eastern European societies, but it's perfectly compatible with European integration. And we have to be, keep an eye on that. Sophie, did you? Um, yes, um, just a couple of points. Uh, what can they, you do to tone down the far right? I mean, um, this is a very complicated issue. Just a couple of things in terms of the institutions. Can the European Parliament do something? I would say not much. What we know is that um, generally far right politicians don't tend to be involved in European Parliament activities. They tend to get elected in the European Parliament. Some of them, for some of them, is actually the first office that they assume, they tend to use funding and income that comes from the European Union, possibly for kind of national uh, level kind of activities. And I wrote a paper about eight, nine years ago called uh, Absent Yet Popular, which basically found that those MEPs who don't go to the European Parliament are more popular in their domestic news. These MEPs in their majority are far right MEPs. Uh, why? Because they use resources in the national context, therefore the news picks up on that. So I don't, I don't think institutionally the parliament could do much. Um, now, in terms of the council, it's a difficult one because we see increasingly that far-right politicians actually participate in the council. Um, we've seen that with Orban, now we'll see what happens with Meloni. And I guess one important difference that is going on at the moment is a question about what is far right and how different it is to conservative right or Christian democratic right because the the lines are becoming very blurred at the moment. So the far right on the one hand is becoming more modernized, mainstreamized and so on. They are toning down some of their discourse. But equally the European right is um, is moving towards more to towards the right when it comes to immigration, when it comes to issues of social rights, abortion, uh, minority rights, LGBTQ rights, and so on. So I, I think the debate is different now, whether it is a debate or not, I if you see what I mean. And I wouldn't see that the council would have any reason or can legitimately say, look, I'm not talking to Meloni, I'm not talking to Orban. They can't do it. They are national, nationally elected. Um, heads of government. So, and, and equally, the, the discussion has, has changed. Now, whether the EU can do something in order to address the issue of the far right, again, I would say not much, because if you do something, it has to be at the national level, not the European Union level. Um, and the policies that, you know, if you want to issue, address issues of, of education, for instance, understanding different cultures, or issues of economic insecurity, again, the root of um, the, the response should be closer to the citizen, right? So I would even say local politics as opposed to national politics and less so European politics. Of course, they, you could uh, have a coordinating role and so on, but they're quite remote to the citizen. I think solutions have to come much closer to the community. Thank you so much to, uh, to our panellists. We've now reached the end of uh, our slot for the round table. So we'll be heading down to the arcade on the ground floor uh, outside if you follow the signs or if you follow us, uh, where there will be a complimentary reception where you can uh, ask some more questions of our panellists. Um, thank you everyone for coming to our first launch event for EIS's uh, 30th birthday. And if you would join me in thanking Alex, Sophia, Jimena and Christophe.